Hello, this is Dr. Craig Bythewood, a.k.a. Dr. B. And this is the week two lecture for Business 539, Financial Management. So the week two subject is about ratios and financial planning. And to explain this important topic, let me provide a little bit of insight into my life. So I am a single father of three daughters age 19, 17, and 15. And I'm currently the assistant coach of the high school team that all three of them have played for. And I've also coached their travel basketball teams uh, since the oldest one was in the fifth grade. So that's a lot of basketball. And one of the things that I see a lot is every time we go into a basketball game, no matter where it is, no matter what kind of game, there are two entities or two individuals or better yet, two roles that I always see. One role is that there's always an individual who is sitting at a table and they are writing something down. <coughs> In other words, every time something happens on the court, they pause and they look down and write. And then something else happens and they look down and write. That person is the statistician or the scorebook keeper. And I want you to think about the fact that that person is simply recording the transactions that they see on the court based on, watch this, a pre-formatted set of rules and regulations that already exist. They're not deciding how to write it. They're not deciding how many points you get for a free throw. It's already been decided. They're simply writing it down. Now, as an assistant coach, it is my job after games like that to go get that piece of paper, take a picture of it, and text it to the head coach. As the head coach, I always get that information that the scorekeeper is doing. Now, what do I do with it if I'm the head coach? I take that information, and I use that information to make decisions. I look at what's on the paper. Quick example. Let's suppose I look at the free throw percentage, and it's very high. Maybe we're shooting 92% from free throws, but only 40% with outside shots. So I may say to my team, okay, next game or this half or whatever the case may be, instead of shooting outside shots, I want you to drive the ball in that will increase the chance of you getting free throws. So you see what I did was I took the data, I took the information, and then I used that to make decisions. What I have just described to you is a very important distinction between two important topics. One, accounting. Accounting is somebody recording the transactions in business based on the pre-formatted set of information. Whereas finance takes that information and uses it to make decisions. So this particular topic, this week two topic, is important because it's both. It's the actual statements that are a result of the recording of the transactions, but it's also going one step further and using that information to make decisions that will be beneficial to the firm, that will be beneficial to the financial management function. So having said that, let's jump right in. And remember what I told you in week one. It is our goal to analyze this information in a way where we take the complex and we make it simpler. So since we've been talking about sports, Let's go a little bit deeper. <coughs> so let's suppose that, uh, okay, let's, let's keep it with my girls. 
So let's suppose they're walking around in their basketball uniforms and someone sees them in a store or a restaurant or whatever. People always ask them two questions. The first question they ask them after they know they play basketball is, do you start? Okay, so normally the answer is yes, but you can imagine what that could do to the self-esteem of a child if they don't start. And then the second question they ask is, what is your record? Now, when the, the, the girls are playing on a team that's doing well, and they say a good record, like right now at this very moment, the high school team is 14 wins, three losses. That sounds great. We're 14 and three. So when you say that, you say the record, then they feel good about themselves. Let's think about this for a second. The record is saying, how is the team doing over a period of time? Now, let me give you another example, and I promise I'll relate it at the end. Oftentimes, they may have uh, family members that are coming to the game and they're late. So when a family member walks into the game and the game has already, ha has already begun to happen, what do you think is the first thing they want to know? They look up to see what the score is. They want to know the score. Is it the score saying how the team is doing at a particular time? So let's break down what I just did. I took the record which says this is how the team is performing over a period of time. And I took the score, which says this is how the team is performing right now. And I made a distinction between them. That's exactly what we do in accounting and finance. Because the record is just like the income statement. The income statement says this is how we're performing over a period of time. The balance sheet is just like a score because it's saying this is how we're performing right now. Now, I'm making a really big deal about this because in my life as a consultant, in my life as a chief financial officer, I've come across so many situations where individuals who do this for a living, individuals with CPAs, individuals who are controllers, they don't always understand this distinction. But when we go past looking at the actual statements, and then we begin to apply the statements to make managerial decisions, it's important to understand the difference between something that comes off the balance sheet, which can be changed immediately. What do you mean changed immediately? Well, we can do something different and it will change because it's the score. You hit a three-pointer, the score just changed. So example, let's suppose that your debt is a certain amount. If you call up the bank and you pay off the debt, didn't it just change? Boom. Well, on the other hand, those information or that information that comes off the income statement, it does not change. It literally stays the same. Why? Because it already happened. So I'm making this, the distinction between the documentation, between the information that you'll get in the income statement, which is over a period of time, versus the information that you'll get on the balance sheet, which is at a period of time. Because when we actually extend this, from an analysis perspective, guess what? We're looking at both of them. So understanding the difference between how the team is doing right now versus how they're doing over a period of time is, is valuable. So since you guys keep bringing up this basketball stuff, I'll give you an example literally from last night. So the high school team won by eight points. It was an away game. It was a district game. It was important because by winning that game, it would allow us to have home playoff games for the first two rounds. Well, guess what? At the end of the game, when they asked if I had any comments, I said this. Ten to nothing. Ten to nothing. I said that because we were losing ten to nothing. So I complimented the young ladies because they persevered, they kept their cool, they stayed together, and they went from losing 10 to nothing to winning by eight. That shows you two things. Number one, look how quickly the score can change, balance sheet. And at the end of the day, the only thing that adds to the record is the one, the one win, the one victory. So what, we do, what we've done here is twofold. Number one, We've made the distinction between what accounting is 
recording the transactions according to GAP, according to pre-formatted set of rules, versus the balance sheet and income statement and understanding that one is a score concept, how are you performing right now, and the other is a record concept, how are you performing over a period of time. In fact, if you go deeper and you look at an income statement and a balance sheet right now, you'll see something you may not have noticed before. On the top of the income statement, it says over a period of time. It will say for the quarter. It'll say for the year ended. But when you look at a balance sheet, it has a date on it as of December 31st, as of January 1st. So those are just some indicators to, to reflect the fact that this concept I'm sharing with you is something that was has always been the case, but we don't oftentimes pay attention to it. Which, of course, takes me back to the point that I made last week that in finance, we want to take the complex and break it down into the simple. Now, now that we have this new understanding of how accounting and finance works, now that we have a bigger or, or a better big picture perspective of income statement and balance sheet, now we can actually use it to make decisions. And if you really think about it, I did it in the first example without you even knowing it. Remember when I said, if the free throw percentage of the team that I'm coaching is 92%, then we're going to take some different action based on the fact that the field goal percentage from outside shots was much lower at 40%. Guess what? Both of those are ratios. Free throws made versus free throw attempted ratio. Outside shot made versus outside shot attempted ratio. So all a ratio is, is simply a relationship between two or more of these financial statement items. And let me back, go, back and go back and say something real clear. Income statement, balance sheet. Examples of financial statements. Are, they, are those the only two financial statements? No, but those are the main ones. So bottom line is, by understanding that a ratio simply takes information that is in either one of those financial statements, or any financial statement for that matter, and it uses it to make a decision, just like I did with the free throw percentage, and just like I did with the field goal percentage. I took those ratios and I used them to make a decision. Now, the easy thing about my example is my example just happens to be based on 100%. We know that 92% is how much you have scored out of 100. And we know that 40% is what your percentage is over 100. But one of the things that you have to walk away with when you analyze financial ratios is you have to understand the interpretation of the number. You have to understand the interpretation of the number. So when you look at financial ratios, there are basically two ways that you can interpret them. One way, <coughs> excuse me, is to look at the ratio and ask yourself, how has this company done over time with this ratio? In other words, if the ratio is three, what does that mean? Three doesn't have any context. But if you look at the fact that it was five last year, then it's gone down to three. If it was eight the year before, it's gone from eight to five to three. You also have to look at it like this. What does three mean? Three what? I understand 92% is an interpretation of what percentage did I make the shots. So when you're doing financial ratios, you have to do more than just do the calculation. In fact, the calculation is the easy part. The part that requires an analysis is, what does three mean? And you answer that question based on what's happening in the actual ratio itself. So I said that the first way you can look at the ratio itself, understanding the interpretation of what it's measuring. Let me say it again. Understanding the interpretation of what it's measuring. Let me say it again because it's extremely important. Understanding the interpretation of what it's measuring. Once you do that, the, the first way is to look at it over time. The second way to look at a ratio is across a comparison. 
So maybe you look at the ratio itself and compare it to other firms in the industry. Maybe you look at the ratio and compare it to a benchmark that you've been given for the industry. So whether you're specifically looking at the benchmark or if you're specifically looking at what other companies are doing, you're still analyzing it from a comparison perspective. So the, the, again, the first way is over time. The second way is from a cross-sectional analysis where you know whether your number is good or bad depending on what everybody else does. You know what's a good example of that? Percentile. You know, percentile is something that is used sometimes to determine whether your size or your test scores is where it is in the subsection of the entire, I'm sorry, where it is in the cross-section of the entire uh, country or region or whatever it is that the analysis is. So I'm going to say this again. When you look at these financial ratios, the calculation is easy. If it says debt over assets, you simply look at the debt, look at the assets, and divide it. That's easy. What requires your analysis is what does the number mean? How do I interpret it? So let me give you an example. A common ratio, a common financial ratio that is used by banks is called debt to income ratio. Now I chose this example for two reasons. Number one, because this is something that you could, a, a, could have experienced in your real life or can experience in your real life. But the second reason why I use this as, as an example is because it uses a balance sheet ratio, excuse me, a balance sheet variable, debt, but it also uses an income statement variable, income. So basically I'm using the score concept debt combined with the record concept, income. So here's how it works. <clears throat> I'm the bank. You are attempting to borrow money from me. So there's several ratios about you that I'm going to analyze, and one of them is debt to income ratio. Now, it's very important when you're analyzing your ratios that you ask the question, do I want it to be high? Do I want it to be low? Do I want this number to get bigger? Do I want this number to get smaller? It is way beyond just the calculation. I keep saying that because it is so important. If you have a bunch of calculations but no context of what they mean, then there's very little value from a financial management perspective. So as the bank, when I look at that debt income ratio, this is what I'm saying. How much debt does this potential borrower have compared to the amount of income that they have? So if you think about it like that in words, I'm doing this on purpose. I'm, I'm using non-numbers on purpose because numbers sometimes put us in a comfort zone where we can have the answer but not the interpretation. And again, the bipolism from week one. If you know what you're doing, you will always have a job. If you know why you're doing it, you will always be the boss. We want to be the boss of the information. So, debt to income ratio, if it's high, that means for that level of money that that person is making, they've got a lot of debt. So I've got to think about whether I want to extend them and add my debt to the debt they, have, they already have. Then, because I'm comparing it to the income, because I'm comparing it to the money that they make, the, the payment of my loan, the payment of the monthly payment is going to come out of their income. So I may say, hey, your debt to income ratio is too high. I need you to bring it down and then I will give you the loan. Or I may say something like, because your debt to income ratio is high, I'm going to charge you a higher interest rate. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you the different components of how to take the information from the ratios and use it for financial planning. Use it to analyze. Use it to make decisions. So as always, these lectures are big picture on purpose. On purpose. So that you can take the specifics, you can take the complexity of what you're getting and be able to understand the basic infrastructure. 
And if you have any questions, please contact me. I made it clear to you in week one why that was important. So this is Dr. Craig Bythewood, a.k.a. Dr. B. This is your financial management week two lecture. Okay, take care.